Hey, real quick before we start the show, I just wanted to do a little shout out to Garden Fork scientist Tony. Um, he had a brain tumor and he posted a pretty amazing little video clip of, well, these staples in his head. And I'm like, oh boy. And I think um, it stuff like that just kind of all of a sudden makes you realize that if you can get up and walk and talk, that the day's pretty good, you know? So uh, we are thinking about you, my friend, and um, maybe you could uh, save some staples for us. <laughs> All right, so say a little. Tony is in the Garden Fork discussion group on Facebook a lot, and he's one of those guys that we. He was just on the show talking about chemicals. Not all chemicals are bad, which I agree with. All right, here we go. Ready, my friend? I am ready. Hey there. Thanks for downloading the show. This is Garden Fork Radio. My name is Eric. I host this DIY eclectic kind of podcast with my cool friends. I also have a YouTube channel, similar, hey, let's try this and see what happens kind of things. Today, we're going to talk about staining wood with my good friend, Rick Kennerly. Hello, sir. Hey, how are you, my friend? I'm good. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, we don't have the hurricane. Do you have the hurricane? Oh, the hurricane Wait. is along the Gulf. Right. Well, it's it's already blown inland, uh, and so um, I think the center part of the country is getting kind of uh, drenched. But um, it hasn't had it. I don't think it's going to hook over this direction. So uh, we're doing pretty good. Just a little thunderstorm in the area. If you listen closely, you'll be able to hear it rumble every now and then. I close the door so you don't hear the air conditioner banging away in the other room. So. <laughs> oh. So long story short. Quite a while ago, um, when I was renovating the house I live in now, I had to um, change out some doors. There were some French doors that opened up into a bedroom, and we wanted them to be solid wood doors. And it was quite a drama to figure out how to get some doors that would fit, because they're it's a brownstone, and the doors were oversized. We finally figured out what to do. But I got these raw pine panel doors, and I had to mm -hmm. st stain them and polyurethane them. And I thought, well, I'll make a video, two videos about this. Um, Get yourself a twofer. And those two videos are some of those popular videos of the recent ones I've done. Constantly people are writing comments about it. And then you um, thought you'd stain some doors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um one, I want to really thank you for those two videos. They helped me um, so much in getting prepared and knowing what to buy and and uh, the importance of reading the label because I did the same thing you did in one of, the, I think, your staining video. I uh, had two cans in my hand. One was a, uh, a, a stain and the other was a polyurethane. And when I was reading the back of the cans, which I learned from the video, I realized they were incompatible. And yeah. so, you know, I mean, you got to really pay attention to this stuff because a mistake can it's it's painful. Uh, yeah. I mean, resanding, um, you know, recovery is uh, is difficult to get back to a clean piece of wood. Well, let's, and so I, I really appreciate your uh, your, um, you know, setting those up for me. Thank you. You can be on the show again. Thank you. OK, well, thank you. I've earned my key. <laughs> so let's backwind. Let's hit the rewind button on the VHS recorder. Because um, this was all sparked by Will Wallace of the Weekend Homestead. Cause it is. Because he, he had a barn door hinge kind of door. And, yeah, he uh, he's renovating this uh, old uh, campground that has some buildings. One, I think, or was that in his house he did Maybe that? In his house. It might have been in his house. He does so much work, it's hard to keep up with him. Yeah. He makes me tired just <laughs> watching him. But... Uh, yeah, he did that. And I looked at it and I said, that's really cool. And so I, you know, I emailed Will and got some tips about how that process works because it's not as, it's straightforward, but it's not as straightforward as you might think about. So um, it's basically like a pipe overhead with these roller wheels that hold a door from the top. And you roll it open and you roll it closed. Right. And his was actually a um, kind of a, a bar instead of a pipe. And that's the real difference between ours. The bar has fixed stanchions where you 
uh, mount, uh, it mounts it. You have to mount at every so often mm-hmm. along the wall, every so many feet or so many inches. And to do that, most of the time, you've got to have a header board, a, a board you put up there uh, that you tie into the uh, the studs yes. because the likelihood of hitting a stud with uh, even a few of those fixed uh, stanchions on the on the back of his rail are very very small. Now, when you have the bar, or at least the system that I have. The stanchions are independent. They, they're, they're loose, and so you can put them where you need them. And it's really easy just to, um, uh, one, put the hardware on top of your door and fit it first, and then pull it, you know, stand it up and lift it up about half an inch off the floor and mark exactly where that is so you'll know where to put the, uh, the stanchion. Did you use and, a stud finder or? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I have to use a stud finder. Uh, you know, to find the studs and I, I locked, um, we had two of these doors and I locked in almost every stud along there. I missed, uh, uh, one and I just put a, used a wall anchor in there because all it was going to do is support it so that it wouldn't sag. Yep. Uh, all the weight was hanging from the, uh, the bar. So that worked out really well. The tricky part about this was, uh, actually staining and, um, uh, and, uh, prepping the doors. Which and that's were where, raw wood when you bought them. Yeah, and they were terribly expensive. Uh, it's um, pine. Uh, the first one, and with a glass insert, it's a specialty glass insert. The uh, pattern is called rain. Which it looks is, like oh. rain. I'm looking. We're gonna we'll post these pictures on the uh, the website for, and okay. they're also in the Garden Fork discussion group. Right, and uh, you know it looks like rain. It, it's um, it's nice. In fact, it is raining outside right now. Uh, all that thunder is paying off. So it provides light, but gives you privacy. Exactly, and uh, when they're lit from the back, they're quite attractive. And um, you know, we just had to do something. Those little bifold doors that came with the house. This is a very old house. Um, were just such a problem, and they they never worked right. And they, uh, you know, anything that's cantilevered like that. Uh, hooked on one side at the top and the bottom, and then the weight is supported out over something is uh, going to be a problematic. And so we just wanted to get rid of them and do something a little nicer. And so that's the solution that we came up with. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, I've i never seen the kind of roller thing that is, a, it's a stainless steel roller pipe because they're usually, they're all painted black to look like you know, a wrought iron kind of blacksmithy thing. So it's interesting yeah. that there's other, where did you buy those? You know, uh, I hate to say this. I did my very best to buy from, uh, uh, you know, independent outfits online that, you know, the restoration hardware, you know, places like that. Yeah. And in the end, and I couldn't find what I wanted because, uh, the pipe, is capped on either end, but I wanted it to be continuous. So the doors could roll all the full length of the pipe. Uh huh. And so there was a kit sold on Amazon that had uh, two 10-foot poles or pipes and uh, a center plug uh, that you took the end caps out and centered the center plug to uh, tie them together. And so I found that kit, and the only place I could find it after uh, weeks of shopping was at Amazon. And uh, it came in at about 160 for the entire, uh, mm-hmm. uh, entire set. One bad. So let's walk through, you, so you've got raw pine doors, you're going to have to tape off the glass, but first, first kind of red flag is you're going to want to stain pine, and pine is a soft wood, and yes. so those stains are built, are designed for hardwoods, so let me, did you make the, mis- the big mistake everyone does, or did you learn from the video? Uh, yes, to both questions. <laughs> <laughs> I um, I went ahead and resanded the uh, doors, even though they came in uh, really nicely sanded. But I would make sure if there was any wax or or anything on there that I, I would got it off, and then I pre-treated uh, the soft pine, and um, with the pre-stain conditioner. Yeah, exactly. It's a pre-stain conditioner, and you yeah, just brush it on or or put it on with the rag. Uh, let it dry about maybe 15, 20 minutes. And then within two hours of putting that on, you have to stain. Yes. And uh, my first attempt at staining, for some reason, uh, she who must be obeyed insisted that I use a brush. 
um, against my better judgment. And I used a brush, but we brought the doors inside the house because we wanted them to dry this century. Yeah. Uh, and um, so we had them set up in the sunroom, uh, a little bit of a fan going over the top of them using a uh, low VOC, volatile organic compound, uh, both stain and uh, polyurethane. So it didn't smell too bad. We weren't uh, frying our brain cells. <laughs> and I put it on, but it dried so quickly behind me that I didn't get a chance to, to rub it off. Yes. And that was my first big mistake. And um, I, I found out that as helpful as your video is, the best video to go see every time is how to fix things. Yeah, how to fix a bad stain job, how to fix a <laughs> – and, and you, you are, are not necessarily a video, just a list, and, and you'll see these discussions. And there will be eight or ten people who have really messed up their stain jobs, and, and you get this good information about what to do. Turns out the really simple thing to do, which – I had, I, I guess I just don't have enough experience to even think about it, is just to put more stain on those spots. Yes. The um, mineral spirits that are in the stain that it will evaporate off also uh, soften and will allow you to work that old stain again and wipe it off. And so that, that was my first big um, you know, screw up with this. And so I went to using a rag after that to work the stain in and doing small sections only maybe a uh, maybe two foot at a time uh, rub it in let it absorb wipe it off move on to the next section section and you can kind of do some blending at that spot where you break yeah you'd and, be surprised that in the end product if you're consistent you can't see where you start stopped and started actually right and then uh yeah we put on um uh two rounds of stain uh on all sides of the doors. So that was taking some time. Uh, one of the things that worked out really well for me is because we had a glass insert, we could set the, uh, the doors on a table and set tuna cans underneath the uh, glass where they touch the glass between the glass and the door. Yep. And so we could flip the, uh, the doors and do them pretty quickly without having to uh, wait for them to dry before you, before you turn them over and having all those sawhorse problems that uh, you sometimes have when you stain. When I'm doing a door like that, I will drill in the top and the bottom some pretty substantial drywall screws, like a three inch, two in the top, two in the bottom, and then you and another person can flip the door like that. So you're not touching the door. You've got these screws in the top and bottom and you can move it that way. That is brilliant. Why, why didn't you put Why didn't Sorry. you put that in the video? Well, that would be video number three. Staining yeah. hacks. Although, although we, we're both crazy in the same way, uh, because mine was more Rube Goldberg. I had thought about suspending um, uh, two pieces of wire or rope from the ceiling and putting the uh, bolts in the center of the door so I could kind of spin them as yeah. I... Uh, <laughs> Would you like to have more Eric in your ears? Maybe not. Um, just kind of a little boost for the Garden Fork patrons. They're people that support me and Garden Fork on a monthly basis. It's kind of like PBS, uh, you know, where you, you basically punt them a couple bucks a month. $3 a month is a suggested starting point for Garden Fork. That's like a cup of coffee a month. What I offer in return for that is some behind the scenes of Eric's world. Using the Patreon app, which is the program we use for this program. Does that make sense? Anyway, I use a website called Patreon to collect the supporters' contributions. They have a pretty robust app and also email system. So throughout the month, I'll post exclusive. That, that sounds kind of hokey. Basically, I take pictures that I don't share on Instagram. And I'm just like, hey, guys, this is what I'm up to today. I'm kind of uh, sharing a little bit more of Eric's world. I'm a little reluctant. Sometimes I just get a little creeped out, basically, by posting too much stuff on the Internet. And this is maybe a little more secure. But anyway, you either get it as an email or if you load the Patreon app onto your phone, which is a really cool app, I think. It's not invasive at all. 
you can look at these pictures and posts and stuff. Plus, just recently, I've added a kind of behind the scenes podcast extra. So as a second podcast, probably three times a week, three times a month now, it's me yakking into the recorder or yakking into a microphone. The last one, I walked around the yard and talked and people seem to like that. First, I just want to also say that was well, that wasn't the first thing I said. But anyway, we do have some new supporters. I want to thank Nicole, Al, and a gentleman who's calling himself Stuck in Japan. And he's inviting me to come to Japan, which is very tempting because I'm intrigued by the ramen shops there. Anyway, more information about becoming a regular contributor to Garden Fork is in the show notes. You just click on the Patreon link or patreon.com slash Garden Fork. Thank you. So I have a couple thoughts here for people. If you're thinking about staining wood, first of all, get some similar wood to your project or scrap wood and practice. Um, take do tests. I because I had to match existing stained wood when I put these doors up. So I would lay down stain and I would first with a sharpie I would create rectangles on the piece of scrap wood. It was pine actually. And then I would do the pre-treatment and then I'd write five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And I would lay down the stain and I'd rub the stain at five minutes, rub it at 10 and rub it at 15. Cause you get an idea of how dark it'll go. And also you get to practice applying stain that way as well. So I would not start at the beginning and all of a sudden, oh, I'm just going to stain this wood, you know, buy a piece of scrap and, and work on that first. Why did you put that in the uh, video? <laughs> okay, well, this is going to be the second thing. We'll have a transcript of this video of this talk, and I will just make a video. So, well, you know, it it would actually be helpful to, um, you know, because a lot of us just don't have your experience in in working with this stuff, and we don't think about the, you know, all the permutations of what to go wrong, how to figure out things. Because that was, you know, how long do you leave stain on? And uh, that was another discussion that went on between she and who must be obeyed myself. And, uh, I was like, uh, you know, let's leave it on just, you know, five minutes and, you know, cause it's, it's easier to restain, make it darker. Right. And, um, and she said, she insisted that the can said 15 minutes and that didn't take into account that we we're inside an air conditioned building with a fan going, you know, ceiling fans blowing down on the, on your work. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course she won. Well, <laughs> let's do some background. She is a registered nurse. So, <laughs> <laughs> there are protocols for everything, and she is a true. brilliant person for even considering being married to you. <laughs> oh, so. You know, uh, yeah, she gets points, just uh, humanitarian points for marrying <laughs> marrying the handicapped. I mean, you know. So uh, let's okay. So another thing people need to realize is you have to let stain dry between coats. Read the can. The can the can spells out the truth. You know, and then when you're going to polyurethane, you have to let it dry again before you apply. So this is like a, it can be a two or three day project. It's, you're not going to get this all done in one day. Yeah. And, uh, we, it's lucky that we, we, we were doing the work ourselves. So we didn't have the pressure of, uh, somebody coming in and we're trying to, uh, finish the doors, the staining and whatnot, and they're going to mount the hardware. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, if, if that happens to you, uh, just know that you can unmount that door and take it back out as soon as the guy finishes with it. Take it back out to your workshop and continue your stain and polyurethane project. Yeah, if so, it's on hinges, you can just pull out the pins and and go. right. So, so there there are ways around almost every obstacle. So should we move on to the polyurethane part of the day? Let me think. Oh no! <laughs> Despite my very best efforts. And using the um, the pretreatment uh, for the stain, I don't know how it happened, but one door on one side came out looking like an Appaloosa horse. Yes, I had the same thing. Yeah, I saw that in your video, and I have no idea why that happened. And so you you learn to just accept that, despite your best efforts, sometimes something is going to happen, and that required me to take the uh, uh, door outside, 
uh, set up in the shade and uh, use a sander and sand it down, uh, get all that stain off and whatever was underneath it. And I have no idea what, what that was underneath it. Interesting uh, yeah. comment on the YouTube video that that happened on. A gentleman uh -huh. said that more than likely at the warehouse, some kind of liquid was splashed on the door while it was being stored. Oh. Maybe, maybe when they were loading it, it was winter and it's salt water or some kind of fluid off of a forklift truck or something. But, um, but yeah, I had to send the whole thing down. So that was very interesting that it was basically somewhere in the process, the manufacturing process, something got spilled on there, sprayed yeah. on there. Yeah. And the other thing that kind of annoyed me is I had already sanded it because, you know, I started off, I, I did a, a pre-sand right. just, just to be sure I would catch anything like that. And I still got caught out. Yeah, it's weird because it goes on and then all of a sudden an hour later, you're like, what is that? And what, what did I do wrong? You know? And, you know, the other thing to realize, though, when these kind of things happen, uh, because of the texture of the glass, it's only on one side uh, and we wanted the texture on the outside. It did occur to me that I it wasn't as bad as I thought because we wanted the texture of the glass on the outside. That particular side was on the, the inside, the back side of the uh, door. And it would be against the wall, and no one would actually see it very much. And so uh, it's kind of like a Christmas tree. You know, you turn the bad right. bad side to the wall. And, <laughs> you know, and that, that so that worked out for me. But I went ahead and re-stained re it and uh, sanded it and re-stained it just to uh, to catch up because I couldn't stand a, a project that wasn't nearly perfect. There you go. So then how did you set about the polyurethane? Polyurethane, one, I stayed in the same family. I used uh, Minwax, and so I wanted to use their Minwax um, polyurethane. That's, that's smart. And uh, this is where I actually screwed up the first time, though, because I had that can that uh, they, there are some varieties of Minwax poly that do not mix with the vari uh, another variety of stain yes, in their, read in their the cans. system. So you got to read them. But I, I got the right one. It was a low volatile organic compound and that stuff is dangerous um, high VOCs um, I mean they they literally they say drinking kills brain cells high VOC really kills brain cells I went to school with a guy uh, who was supposedly pretty bright at one time and he worked in the uh, uh, university press uh, oh, printing, printing office press, yeah and uh, he was cleaning uh, those machines every day with uh, high VOC and not wearing a respirator or gloves. And uh, he ended up uh, mentally in a very bad place. Yeah. Um, you can it, get an organic vapor mask very, I mean, they're 30, four, maybe 40 bucks. It's so worth it. Yeah. Yeah. And they're worth it just for the, the peace of mind, even if you're using a low VOC. Uh, and I bought one and used it. Yeah. So. Also, it, just kind of real quick, there there are there are water based polyurethanes. There's oil based polyurethanes, and then there are these blended ones as well. And I almost got caught up in this because the stain I was using, I learned I had to buy the special kind of Minwax poly that is actually kind of hard to find. But I found it and oh. used it. But just read read the cans because even a, even in a same manufacturer, they're not all compatible. Right. And, uh, you know, they they have, you know, oil-based stains, water-based stains, and then they have the new gel stains. Yeah. And and that I think the gel, the real incompatibility happens over there on that gel end. But uh, they're, they're just all kinds of little things that you have to keep track of. I've never had a good experience with the gel stains, but it's it's I haven't done it a lot either. So, yeah. And so the, the poly went fine, uh, getting it on, uh, getting it to stay, just take your time, put it on thin and, uh, and, you know, pay attention to what you're doing. Find some, ref something that reflects, you know, like light, uh, from a window and get down low and see if there are any voids or hollows and be sure and check for holidays, you know, little drips down the side that yeah. pool up on the back side of your, your, um, door. Oops. Oops. Yeah, I, I had a few of those the first time. You can use a clamp light for that as well if you don't have a, a – a, that way you can shine. You can move the clamp light around or have your friend move the clamp light around at a really low angle to the door, and you can look right across the whole thing. Yeah. I actually was using my um, my sitting bucket, uh, my um, 
orange store bucket that has a lid yeah. that I that I use for gardening. But I actually sat on that, so I'd be at a really low angle, so I could uh, see uh, any holidays, missed spots, because uh, you re- want to do a very fine job, but you want to do a very thin job. Yeah. Uh, too much, um, too much poly is not your friend. When you're mixing polyurethane, do not shake it. You want to stir it because if you shake it, you'll introduce air bubbles into it, which make for a very poor finish. Yeah, uh, particularly if you're not if uh, it's your final finish. Yeah, uh, you can correct for that with um, a little bit of uh, steel wool. Tell, tell me, do you steel wool or do you uh, sand between your your finishes? I use the steel wool. Uh, I don't understand how it works. It seems counterintuitive that you're sanding. The polyurethane, the smooth polyurethane you just put down, but it makes a huge difference. You're you're knocking down the little high points. You're giving a tooth to the new layer, and I I use poly uh, steel wool, four aught steel wool, very fine steel wool, and then I go over it with a tack cloth, which is cheesecloth that has I think beeswax in it, and that lifts up all the uh, the debris that you've you've scuffed up basically. Right. And take your time between uh, coats and really work the uh, the uh, tack rag because uh, that's where you'll screw up your finish. You'll uh, get a little sand or a little debris from the uh, the uh, steel wool. And next thing you know, you've sealed that in under the coat. Yeah. And the, the more time you take, the better. It, t- it takes a while for the polyurethane to cure each time. Some of them say you can recoat in an hour. It just depends, you know. If all else fails, read directions. So. <laughs> yeah, I I was I had enough time that I could uh, recoat uh, just once a day, get a nice hard finish every day, and I think that really helped to um, to make it come out looking good. They look great. At least acceptable. Is that a satin finish? A satin polyurethane? It's, it's a satin finish. Yeah. I think that looks better. My floors in my brownstone were polyurethane with this super shiny super high gloss and it was horrible but um luckily we have labradors who knocked that finish down pretty quick (laughs) (laughs) just scuffed it right up yeah that and my my robot vacuum so but you know it it came out all right but it was uh frustrating and uh, i spent one really sleepless night just uh, you know uh, when that appaloosa finish came out uh just you know, cursing everybody and everything. Right, because they're expensive doors, and you're like, "What the h did I do?" You know, yeah. and it's some. You have to realize that not everything is within your control. So, oh, what one thing we do need to talk about? First of all, this was not the first set of doors. This project's been hanging fire since um, March. Uh, we the custom ordered doors. We got them from the Orange Store, and when they arrived, uh, the manufacturer had put the wrong glass inside. And so they had to reorder and then they reordered and they showed up and for some reason they were pallet mounted just raw together and it had pallet straps uh, where they had crushed the wood uh, tying the corners. The, yeah. Well, now in the corners across the middle of the door. Ooh. And so I was thinking, well, do I send it back and uh, you know, refuse it? And order another set, and uh, you'd think, well, they'll find a new way to screw those up. Yeah. And so I went ahead and took them because they were at least pretty close to what we wanted. And I did spend a a lot of time um, uh, sanding and filling. Uh, And I should have called you and asked what kind of wood filler do you use? or Because, I mean, there's the micro bubbles. um, You know, it's almost like uh, styrofoam that you can put in there and then there's a uh, standard wood filler which i have no idea what that stuff is it's um, sawdust and a and a glue. Sci- and a glue a, a stain compliant glue basically yeah and frankly those those spots did not uh, stain up as well as i'd hoped no no they won't but i you know i i, I worked with what i had and um uh, it's like you told me and this is the best advice you ever gave me you know, in two weeks, you'll not notice. Exactly. Because, you know, you're obsessing about this. And when you get the doors up, there's going to be other stuff around the doors. And your eyes are looking all over the place, not at the lower left corner where that little ding is in the door. Yeah, exactly. I would paint so many rooms when I had my painting contracting business. And the client would obsess over what kind of green color. And I'd be like, look, 
why don't you put all your junk in this room? <laughs> and it was true. And it would really be kind of crushing because we would build, we'd paint these beautiful rooms and then I'd maybe have to come back a week later to get paid or something or, or hang something for them. And they put all this junk in the room and I'm like, what did you do to my room? You know? <laughs> Uh, well, you know, I had not, I knew that lesson. It's just you had to remind me because yeah. uh, I painted our front door and um, it was a two tone paint, uh, kind of a beige and a black trim. And there were spots on there that it was so hot and I was so tired. I said, I'm just going to have to come back out and finish this and, you know, take it off and redo it again. And I talked myself out of it. And uh, a week later, uh, I, I'd forgotten all about that little flaw down that that little corner over there. Yeah. So, you I, know, it, it happens. I do want to circle back to the uh, on Minwax. I think it's called pre-stain conditioner because my father-in-law um, got me to stain. He he's a cabinet maker. He's very talented. He's like, oh, you can do all the staining, and he he gave me this can of pre-stain conditioner. I'm like, I don't need this. This is you know we don't you know. And you really do on softwoods like pine, you really do need to use that because pine, the heartwood and the sapwood, the different pieces of the wood absorb stain radically differently. And the pre-stain conditioner smooths that out. So do not skip that step because you will learn from me. <laughs> Well, you know, and, and like I say, you just have to take your time and, and really do every step. There are no shortcuts in uh, in doing that. Oh, that's going to be the title of the show. There are no shortcuts in staining wood. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think. Do you shop on Amazon? I shop locally and also on Amazon and other online stores. If I need something very specific, like seat covers for the new used car we just bought, I will go online and sometimes use Amazon. And Garden Fork happens to have a dedicated shopping page on the Amazon site now, which is very cool. It is an affiliate linked page. We do get a finder's fee for anything that you buy when you start shopping from that page. But I list there interesting items that I think are worthy of the Garden Fork DIY person. It's amazon.com slash shop slash garden fork. If you would start your Amazon shopping experience, no matter what you're looking for on Amazon, start at Garden Fork and that would be great. It's amazon.com slash shop slash garden fork. That's amazon.com slash shop slash garden fork. So, um, total left turn here. Okay. Okay. I, um, I would like to listen to more podcasts and I'd actually, I'm interested in interview podcasts, but a lot of the interview podcasts, this is for everyone, not just Rick, are always about like movie stars. And I would rather they be about interesting people that aren't movie stars. Oh, well then you're just listening to the wrong podcast. Okay. First is long form podcast. That's what it's called. Yeah. Long form podcast. And they, interview some of the most interesting people, uh, writers, authors, business people, uh, academics, thinkers, uh, all kinds of things. It is wonderful. Because the iTunes, you know, you go to iTunes podcast, their suggestion machine is always taught, you know, this, this movie star or this actor has a new podcast and they're just interviewing other actors about act how they were acting in LA. And I'm like, I know. Yeah, no. yeah. Yeah. I understand. No, I understand your, I feel your pain. The other is Aspen ideas to go. Uh huh. And this is a A S P E N it's after the Aspen festival in Aspen, Colorado. And it's, a, it's kind of like Ted talks, but they're, uh, they're audio and they're it's less a chance. Saccharine. Yeah. And yeah, they're, they're a little less, uh, you know, sometimes I loved I loved TED Talks when they began, but you know, uh, people have started parodying them because they were just uh, so set, and you know, you, where you tint your fingers and all the all the little things you do that just it was almost like a formula to have a TED Talk. I thought about doing a Garden Fork version of the TED Talk about something really just mundane or just off the freaking wall. <laughs> 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 now here is one that I absolutely adore, and I think you will too. It's called, it's from the BBC. It's thirty animals that made us smarter. Ooh. And it's about geckos. How gecko? It's really about biomimicry. 
how we're creating things, uh, new things for science and human beings uh, by mimicking nature. Um, geckos and adhesive because of the way they're, they can climb anything with pads that are not sticky. They're actually hairy. And so it's, it's counterintuitive. Spiders and robots. They're making rescue robots now that work like spiders. Do you know spiders do not have muscles oh, I in, didn't their, know that. in their legs? They work on hydraulics. They increase blood pressure to extend. That's when you see a dead spider and it's all curled up. Uh, that's its natural state. It has blood pressure. It increases the blood pressure to extend that leg and oh, then wow. releases the pressure to close it. And they're creating uh, robots that work like that, that can run as fast as a spider, uh, maneuver like a spider, climb walls. Uh, and the, the, idea, the idea of the robot is um, that it would be a rescue robot going into rubble and debris, looking for survivors, taking in microphones, that kind of thing. Sharks. Sharks have uh, particularly the sharks a podcast or this is thing no 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 i'm just just fascinated by this story i can tell Uh, my my last one now i'll pass i'll shut up thank you rick but the the shark (laughs) and the glockopus shark particularly has a skin that bacteria will not adhere to Mm. because of the way it's constructed and they're bio using that as biomimicry in hospitals now on surfaces that people touch because bacteria will not adhere and grow to that. Wow. And so it's it's just fascinating uh, stories about um, you know, things around us in the world. And it also makes you wonder you know, if we're losing all these species, how many uh, uh, you know, really great ideas and technologies are, are going to go with them because we didn't realize soon enough um, you know, through extinction uh, uh, what uh, wonder some of these uh, uh, animals have solved what problems they'd solved wow well thank you all right i will link i will put those names in the podcast notes um which you can by the way you can see depending on which podcast app you're using if you just scroll up from the little player usually like the little garden fork video icon and you can scroll up just thumb up swipe up i guess on your phone and at least in the itunes pod the podcast app for the app iphones all the text, the informational text is below with clickable links. One of right. those clickable links is to sign up for my weekly email, which you are missing out on. So, I'm not missing out on it. You can also just go to our website, and it should be on every page. But if, if not, gardenfork.tv slash news. The link will be in the show notes here. One more podcast, and I'll let you go. Okay. One more. I promise. Okay. It's uh, Science Rules with Bill Nye. Oh, I just saw an image for that. And he does remarkable interviews in the realm of science about uh, all the things you're interested in, space launches and uh, solar sails, um, you know, search for extraterrestrial life, uh, just everything space related. And and he's, you know, he's moving into more regular science or other science issues as well. But it's, it's just, it's wonderful to hear you know, interesting, positive uh, people that are getting us out of our every everyday grubby little existences and and uh, political turmoil to uh, to listen to some of this stuff and uh, get away from that and kind of lift your eyes up a little bit. All right, yeah, I actually saw a uh, a documentary about him, and he was it was very good. He was uh, debating several times. Um, this gentleman who uh, denies re- uh, evolution, and I don't, I don't know if he built the ark. That's, um, it's, I think it's in the middle of the country, but he visited that ar- uh, that ark they built with the uh, evolution denier, and they had kind of debate in the ark itself. And I think, <laughs> I think in one of the stalls, when the animal stalls was like a pterodactyl or something. Um, a prehistoric dinosaur like animal and Bill Nye is like, how can you have a dinosaur in your ark? Because when Noah was alive, they didn't have this dinosaur. And it was interesting. Yeah. He's fighting the good fight. So I give him a lot of credit. 
He's also president of the uh, Planetary Society. Uh, did you know that the uh, Planetary Society launched a, uh, essentially a CubeSat yeah. that that has a solar sail? So yes. So they're actually, you know, these are amateur astronomers or at least uh, the private sector going out there and doing these proof of concept things to uh, to prove they actually work. And that's very much a bootstrapped organization. So. Oh, very much, very much. So s along those same lines, uh, I don't know if you've seen um, – the new PBS series called Chasing the Moon. Not yet, but I plan to. Amazing. Is it? It's no, there are no talking heads in it. And um, I'd, I'd heard that. I'm, yeah. a, I'm a PBS donor. I think I think I give them like $6 a month and I, I get what's called their passport to their back catalog. So it already broadcasts and it will rebroadcast. I think you can watch it online for maybe the next month. But if you become a PBS passport supporter you get their whole back catalog you can watch on their website or through your apple tv box and it's pretty amazing but i'm a big mean moon geek me and jimmy uh my executive producer have been jimmy talking Goots. about it we're trying to get mike from space rocket history on but go check that out chasing the moon it's great because they're interviewing people who weren't the they don't interview neil armstrong they're interviewing other people some of them, you know, behind this, a lot of behind the scenes people. Um, one of the few NASA engineers who was a woman uh, is interviewed in there. I know it's just really good. And it's all, um, there's voiceover interviews and then showing uh, footage during the NASA moon rocket. I'm mumbling. And during the 60s. So it's not a lot of this Ken Burns talking head stuff. Right. And, and I heard a podcast, uh, I think it was a long form podcast with the uh, director or the producer of that yeah. series. And he said they did that intentionally. They did not want to uh, distract from the visual images. And they went way beyond the NASA catalog, which is what most people use yes. for the uh, for the films. They were going everywhere in the world trying to find more footage and more people to talk to. And so it's not just a rehash of uh, things you've probably seen a dozen times from NASA. Yeah. This is uh, all, well, not all, but a lot new material. But they didn't want to distract from the visual. So they just had the audio uh, cover. Yeah. Uh, and it, it worked out beautifully, I think. Uh, I, I have seen trailers, but I haven't seen the actual thing. Waiting for a good moment, like when I finished my stain job. Well, speaking of another beautiful moment, uh, this is the time of the show where we go and look and see if we had any new reviews on iTunes. Oh, I hope so. Do, 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 you know, Eric is actually crushed if there are no reviews. Do, 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 and if you love Eric, you go and do a, a review. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six. Six new ones. Well, that's great. Are you, there sounds like there's wind blowing over your microphone. There's thunder outside. Oh, <laughs> okay. First one, deep dive on being handy. I grew up as a kid fascinated with the Foxfire books. Hand up. Me too. Me too. And Eric's yeah. homespun advice and how to's reminds me of those books. YouTube channel is also a must. Great info and fun to listen to. Five stars. Thank you, Bill. Uh, from Wonderful. B Master 13, 2019 update. You can update your review, by the way. Eric has really dedicated himself to improving the podcast and his videos. What's he mean by well. that? <laughs> oh, was that in all caps? Taking classes, upgraded equipment, and elevated confidence. Oh, elevated confidence, yeah. A must listen for the DIY enthusiast. Eric and his friends host an eclectic DIY homesteading, gardening, cooking, and much more podcast. Eric's a longtime video blogger and is extended into this podcast. He splits his time between Brooklyn and his cabin in the woods each episode is a fun mix of topics on whatever is holding their interest at the moment exactly each episode feels like a visit with good friends who have lots of practical advice i credit eric with giving a city boy like me the courage to buy and fix up a cabin in the woods holy cow <laughs> wow yeah you're you're the next henry david thoreau i should what get a commission on these mortgages you will learn <laughs> you will laugh and you will be inspired to try something new oh how cool is that yeah, well, that's wonderful. Thank you for that. Uh, Fidget and Smudge, five stars. Really enjoyed listening to the podcast during the day while I work. There's a lot of good information to learn, and Eric and his crew keep me laughing. Keep up the good work. Also, love the videos. Yay. Thank you. I think this is for yes. Tina. Uh, Bosworth Group says, DIY at its best, five stars. 
Eric and his co-host slash friends will educate you on everything from DIY as well as humor, interesting facts, and Labradors too. Eric's approach of if I can do it, you can do it, and done is better than perfect will encourage you to tackle those projects. Wow, my mantras wow. are coming through. That's great. Yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, fun and educational five stars by Timza, T-M-Z-Z-A. I've yet to come away without learning something new. Listening to Eric and his friends is like sitting around with friends and having a wonderful conversation. It's exactly what I want this to be like. It is. Uh, it's fun and always I look forward to the next show. It makes my 3 a.m. commute to work more enjoyable. Oh, boy. Oh, that's painful. <laughs> the show is a great addition to the YouTube channel. Keep up the great fr work, my friends, from Tony. Thank you, I Tony. I wonder which Tony that is. Hmm. A uh, great pod podcast by Jennifer Ohio. I've been listening for years. This podcast is so multifaceted, but always interesting and educational. Thank you, Eric and Rick, my favorite co-host. Uh, Ooh. Oh, who was that again? Uh, Jennifer Ohio. Jennifer. Well, thank you, Jennifer. Rick will be over there in his Prius very quickly. That's right. Buy you some pancakes. I'll, I'll even drive the uh, Prius Prime instead of the Prius Primitive. <laughs> All right, so we, oh, wow, this is a long show, but... You should feel good. You should feel loved. I do. Are you feeling, are you feeling the love? I do. I feel okay. I feel better than when I did walking out of my therapist's office this morning, so... <laughs> which we're going to talk about. We're, Rick and I are threatening to talk about it, so we need to talk about uh, therapy, so... Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you for taking time, sir. Thank you for telling oh. your epic story. Yeah, it was kind of epic. I felt like I was uh, dominating the narrative, but then again, it was my narrative, so you couldn't tell it for me. I thought you were banging the microphone. I didn't realize it was thunder. <laughs> yeah. All right, everyone, go out and make it a great day. Radio at GardenFork.tv. I always want to hear from you guys. Thank you. Talk to you later, my friend. Bye-bye. Garden Fork Radio's executive producer is Jimmy Goots of hollowbooks.com. And our music is licensed from uniquetracks.com.